Okay, so I guess we are good to start. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for attending our uh, September uh, meeting. Uh, I hope that you would enjoy uh, this meeting, and I'm sure that there are going to be lots of takeaways uh, from our uh, presentations. So the main theme of today's presentations is parametric modeling with advanced parametric tools, such as uh, optimization with Open Studio and Design Builder. Before each presentation, uh, I'm gonna give you a brief introduction about our presenters. Uh, and then we're gonna have a 20 minutes presentation followed by five to 10 minutes Q and A. So you can either raise your hand during the question period, or you can enter your questions into the Zoom chat or YouTube live chat, and they will be addressed uh, to the presenters. Uh, also, you can use these uh, barcodes or the links here to check out the IBEPSA US, uh, USA jobs, and also if you are interested to become a member of IBEPSA USA. So if you don't have any further um, questions, and uh, also I would like to remind you to uh, mute your mics uh, during the presentation, um, and then during the Q&A, you have uh, the opportunity to ask uh, your questions. So if you don't have any questions or concerns, I can start with uh, introducing our first presenter, uh, Craig Simmons. Uh, he has more than 15 years professional experience in uh, commercial building in energy analysis, utility program design and review, and building codes uh, compliance. Craig is currently leading VEIC's work, leveraging, leveraging Open Studio and related scaling and automation techniques to support building population studies, grid interactive building analysis, refrigeration analysis, and create automated building energy management-based calculation tools. This work leverages strong relationships with the Department of Energy, DOE, and the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, NREL, to access the most advanced building energy modeling techniques and software. Thank you, Greg, uh, for making time for IBEPSA Boston chapter, despite your busy schedule, and floor is yours. All right, thank you. Um, all right, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and get the presentation up. There we go. I think that should work. Um, yeah, so thank you for that. Oops, I guess you're not seeing it yet. Here we go. Now are you seeing it? Okay, great. Yes, that's great. <clears throat> um, great, yeah, so so thank you. I'm gonna put a caveat here as of before I start that I do have three kids stuck at home today for <laughs> various reasons in our, uh, our world today. So please, uh, ex please forgive any interruptions if they should happen. Um, so yeah, so we're, I think, you know, one of the, what I'd like to talk about is, you know, so we use parametric modeling in a lot of different ways. Um, and, and to me, that topic isn't necessarily new and it's more the context, I think, in, in that I'd like to talk about that's, that's more new, which is, you know, sort of using the modeling that we've, we've all been doing, which is, you know, generally been geared towards efficiency programs and in specific buildings. And actually, you know, now with with sort of today's world and, and, and grid constraints and things like that, like, you know, how do you turn that modeling actually in service to, to directly to the utilities themselves and sort of the the, the, the metrics that they're interested in? Um, and I think we're in an exciting time because, you know, we're in a time now where, you know, we actually can serve the utilities directly in addition to sort of the efficiency programs and, and the owners and things like that. So this is, you know, sort of a little bit of a background on work we're doing where we are partnering more with, you know, in addition to efficiency programs and building owners, actually working directly with the utility partners as well. Um, so quickly, just a little background on uh, source energy and time of use. And I have a train going by at just the right time as well. So <laughs> take it as it comes. Um, I think my mic does a pretty good job at taking that out. The um, So, you know, as we go forward here, and you know, I think we all know this, energy efficiency isn't, you know, we're kind of in energy efficiency 2.0, which means that like we, it's still important, it's still essential. If we're gonna get to net zero, we have to reduce loads first, right? But as we think about the grid as a whole, you know, the when we use electricity is now just as important as how much we use. Um, and so, you know, the analysis 
and, and the reason for that, you know, gets back into source energy and, and, and the timing and everything. So I think, you know, a lot of people know about this, but, you know, source energy now is that the, where does energy come from? Is it coal? Is, is it in this picture versus the site energy, which is the energy you're building to use. And so in, in a lot of the conversations we're having now, and I think this is true across the board, is that, you know, a lot of the strategic electrification is, is the theme. Um, this has been, you know, in the past couple of years, this has been the ground work of, you know, and all of the efficiency program sort of market analysis and studies we do, it's, it's all about, especially in colder climates like we have in uh, New England, it's really focused on, well, okay, if we're going to get to a clean grid, we know we need to electrify. How do we do that? And also sort of control the impacts of that, because when you start putting, you know, whether it's heat pumps or even resistance heating on the grid, you're going to create new, new constraints that, you know, maybe existed 30 years ago, but we've kind of dealt with it and now we're gonna have to deal with it again. So, you know, so the combination of that, the source of that energy, you know, in, in moving that, that source energy to renewable resources, but those are only available at certain times and then trying to get rid of, so trying to flatten out the load and, and use storage and things so we can get, we can use the energy at the right time, right? And we can have less greenhouse gas reductions, even if we use, a, you know, say we get a building down to the low 20s EUI, well, is it using that energy at times when the grid is having to fire up really dirty power plants, really expensive energy, or at times when that's lower use? And so that fuel mix here is, um, this is two sort of shots. The one on the left is ISO New England, right? So it's a breakdown. Right. So starting with, sorry, was that it? Someone asking something? No, no, okay. no, just go ahead. They didn't, okay. they forgot to mute their Okay, that's fine. The, uh, so, you know, ISO New England is on the left here with, you know, their breakout of, of energy. And now this is sort of a snap. This would be like an annual average, right? So the, the trick to this is that this mix changes at different times of the day. And at the, at the times of the year where the grid is most constrained is when sort of the worst of the worst comes on. And not only that, but that, that energy is extremely expensive and it drives the rates for the entire year those one or two hours with the things that most trained. On the right here is actually Green Mountain Power's fuel mix as of 2019. And now that, you know, they're, they happen to have good access to a lot of Canadian hydropower. So, you know, in a, in a lot of senses, their, their mix is greener, I guess, than, than most areas of the grid. But it's still, again, when you get to those constrained points, you know, those points of really high demand, you know, this hydro is a fairly steady base but at those points of high demand, then that's when all the, the sort of dirtiest mix of fuel is going to happen. So when is that? And so this is just looking again, this is ISO New England as sort of a proxy. We have it's better available data for ISO New England. So I'll use some slides for that, but just kind of shows you, you know, this is on an hourly basis, you know, just kind of the overall, um, this is actually greenhouse gas emissions uh, associated with the grid mix at different hours of the year. Right. And this is a, this is basically an average metric, but, but done hourly. And so we use a lot of graphs like this. So when we do our carbon analysis, when we do these electrification analysis, what we'll do is we'll overlay now the building's energy use, right? And we can use Open Studio and, and other modeling softwares to do this in an automated sense and create metrics out of it and where we can sort of overlay that hourly use of the building with sort of the, this grid, you know, greenhouse gas emissions matrix. Um, and this is one I'll come back to a little bit later just to show, but this is essentially the same grid as a heat map, right? So these greener areas are, are times of less intense greenhouse gas emissions associated with the source of the electric grid production. And then the dark gray areas are your, are your more intense, your dirtier times of the day, right? But same, basically the same data that was shown before. Okay, so our, what I'm going to try to walk you through is a progression. So we had a, a few years ago, we had this an opportunity to work with Green Mountain Power, um, BEIC. I should back up BEIC. We do a lot of analysis and in program support for states and, and utility programs. We operate a handful of utility programs, which include um, Efficiency Vermont up here in Vermont, the DCSU in, in, in DC, and then a bunch of municipal programs throughout the Midwest. Um, but then we also do you know all kinds of consulting in between. So in this particular project, we were sort of acting as Efficiency Vermont, working directly with Green Mountain Power as a partner, and then working with uh, Burn Burton Academy with a new construction project they had that had some, so it's just, you know, they had some really, I think just from the school philosophy, they really wanted to do 
some good with their, this building. It was a um, community center or a student center for them. So they, they had some good goals on their end. And we combined that with Green Mountain Power has been very proactive. They have some residential programs with Tesla batteries and some other programs that I'll get into in a little bit. But they, you know, there's an opportunity to sort of bring these players together and, and, and try to do some work in sort of finding common objectives in a, in a, in a specific project. Um, and so, you know, from the school's standpoint, they wanted to be net zero ready. <clears throat> they wanted the ability, you know, exceed code requirements, of course. Um, and, and it was really important to them sort of how the building interacted with their students. And, you know, as, as not being an architect, I won't get into that, but there's lots of daylight, there's lots of fresh air. Um, and in the end, but we by partnering with Green Mountain Power, in addition to sort of getting the high efficiency building, we were able to sort of really get some intelligent control of the systems and optimization that will help Green Mountain Power with their need to, you know, to avoid power usage during high constraint times. Um, the system in this case is, you know, you know essentially it's uh, air to water heat pumps with some backup electric, actually straight up electric boilers. This is 100% electric building. Um, and electric boilers are kind of nice in the way that they're super cheap. <laughs> you don't want to operate them often, but if you need something to back up on, it's, it's a good option. Um, in the end, so we have, so it's air to water heat pumps, right? Going into a central loop that is then um, the actual zonal control is, is water source heat pump. So the nice combination here is that you know, we don't necessarily need to produce super hot water on the air to water heat pumps. Although in this case, we found that it actually was beneficial to, to do most of the heating at that level um, and vice versa in the cooling. So you have these water source heat pumps in the zones that can you know reject and, and take heat from a central loop. Um, and then the, the end result here was that we ended up with a, a 2000 gallon storage tank, right? So that became sort of the, the regulator for the building in terms of being able to control when um, the hot water, you know, when to use the, the hot water generation and chill water generation. Um, the, so it, it, and essentially the parameters here we were doing is that some of this design was already, you know, there was a few alterations, you know, they considered all air source heat pumps. We were able to pretty quickly get to a decision point of having a, a water-based system partly because Green Mountain Power was willing to come to the table and, and have this discussion around demand flexibility and offering support. So there's you know, support from the efficiency program around sort of traditional energy efficiency, but now Green Mountain Power was at the table with support for you know, being able to leverage this building as, as a grid resource. Um, and that really pretty quickly allowed us to get into this realm of, of working with a, a hydronic system, working with air to water heat pumps. And the optimization was then able, you know, we didn't have to spend a lot of time on Sort of systems options and instead could spend time on some metrics around you know how to sort of size these the system within the constraints of the project one of those constraints being that uh the timing i think we came in about sd level the timing wasn't ideal and so we had some size constraints you know on the you know we couldn't we didn't have infinite tank room essentially which is i mean it's often a problem so this is a you know with this heat map is here is that there's a controllable load, load rider that GMP has. So, you know, for, for buildings willing to participate in this program, um, what they'll do is, you know, with I think about 24 hours notice, they'll say, hey, we have an event coming up. And if you're able to curtail your load during that event, then you, you can tap into this special rate of theirs. And so this is a, for the year 2018, this is a heat map of when those calls were, right? So you have months across the bottom and hour of the day across the top. Um, so this is just showing you when those hours were. And then the, the gradation in the in this scale has to do with our the, the, the building we were evaluating, right? And it's the level of its energy use within, you know, if you overlay its energy use with these 2018 calls, it was just kind of a way to get a sense of like, okay, how much, how much energy are we talking about that occurs in these these times you know, for, on a sample year? Um, so then that led us into so the analysis we ran then. So then parametrically, we could look at this demand flex, so like how much flex could we get um, in these, you know, generally about a four hour window, and then costs. We could figure out this, based on the control of the load rider, you know, what, what, the, what the overall cost of the operation was. And then, you know, the parameters then we were sort of sending through that were 
a variety of tank sizes, although I think we were constrained to less than 5,000. Um, and, and there ended up being some other constraints in there. And then looking at both the, the delivery temperatures of the air to water heat pumps into the central heat pump loop, um, which again, we actually ended up tending towards higher, about 130 degree delivery temperature in some colder conditions, um, because that strategy ended up being better from the thermal storage standpoint than to, you know, if we rely on the, the zonal heat pumps more than that actually ends up using more energy out in the zone rather than take, letting us take full advantage of the, the thermal storage. Um, and so that's where, you know, one of the sort of interesting dynamics that comes to play is that even though it maybe isn't the most efficient use of energy on the whole, the cost implications took us to a solution that, that had us drive those um, central loop temperatures a little bit higher. And then we looked a little bit at the, on the timing. And so this is essentially on the, on the right here is what we came up with in terms of timing, which is, you know, charging the tank through the morning, coasting through a little bit of the, the morning section, charging again in the afternoon, early afternoon, and then coasting through the afternoon. And if I go, I think if I go back, you know, that sort of lines up with, you know, here's these peak times here all throughout the year, those peaks that happen in this afternoon stretch, but there are occasionally these calls in the morning for this, you know, curtailable load. Um, and so it ended up being a little bit, and just for simplicity, I mean, there is, you know, there's all kinds of things you potentially could do around, you know, maybe having a, a control scheme that was weather dependent and just, you know, the, the reality is it's much easier to just put a schedule in place. And so that's the end result was a schedule. And we just sort of played with the hours to find the hours that work best. Um, so this is, you know, this is a load profile of what that looks like. So again, we're driving. So, you know, areas in red are where we're driving, you know, the system in this building. So this is just with, this is a comparison of with and without energy storage. It just shows you the advantage of that 2000 gallon tank, right? So where we're in the red, we're driving it. We're driving those air to water heat pumps and sometimes the backup boiler is harder than they would otherwise be driven. And then the green is where we're letting them coast, right? And, and getting advantage out of it. It looks like we forgot the color of this stretch here, right? So there's a, a bunch of section in the sort of early morning where we get, we're able to sort of coast and use that tank. And then again, in the afternoon, which is, you know, this is the winter. So this carbon profile in red, this is actually specific to the winter load profile. We're in Vermont, the cooling was relatively low in this building. And so the summer load profile wasn't as big a concern. Um, so just a little side note there is like, obviously all this stuff is climate specific, right? Um, so this is again, looking at just, so this is the, our basically our carbon savings, right? So things in green are where, you know, basically essentially the green is the green here. So the green is where we're able to coast and save carbon. Um, and then the darker gray is where we're actually using more than we would otherwise. Um, so. Yeah, you know, just shows alignment, right? So then overall the building performance. So just, so here's some of the, the interesting things. So we have, you know, pretty decent. I, I didn't look up the EUI, I forget the square footage of this building. So that's a metric I can get people if they're really interested in that. But we saved, I mean, if you just look at kilowatt hours, so this is, you know, we did analysis for efficiency programs on, on fuel baselines and things like that. Um, to me, that wasn't the really interesting thing. More interesting is in this case, we're talking about a baseline of with thermal energy storage versus without, right? So kind of an apples apples comparison. One of the surprising things was that we actually saved about 7% of energy. And that largely had to do with the timing of when we were using the air, air to water heat pumps. And that ended up, th those savings actually occur more, even though cooling was a lower part of the overall energy use, you know, more of our savings in this respect occurred on the cooling or, or mild sort of shoulder seasons when uh, we were just able to use the heat pumps at a, at a beneficial time of day. Um, just th they're not having to reject heat. Um, they're not having to work against sort of that, that lower rise in, in temperature. Um, so that was, and then the carbon emissions, you know, this again, just has to do with timing of when we're using energy versus when the grid is at its dirtiest. Um, so, you know, for just thermal energy storage, it, you know, that seemed like a pretty good result to us. Um, so, where does this take us? So, you know, that was sort of one example, you know, we're able to, we actually had to do a lot of work by hand there. This was several years ago. Um, in, in the meantime, um, Energy Plus has evolved quite a bit, Open Studio, the labs have done a lot of work there. And so a lot of the things, in addition, like 
the reason we like Open Studio is that as we do things by hand, we can sort of in, we could we have the knowledge and skills to sort of write and automate those things, and so we can start to sort of you know once we've done a project that's manually intensive as that one was then we can actually start to take pieces of that and feed it into more and more analysis in the future and you know energy open studio as a as a software allows us to do that because you know you have energy plus at the core seem a lot of programs um the sort of first layer out just looking at layers of open studio is this the, the what we call the application um and we've done a lot of work to sort of help keep that free and open source software but really the power starts to happen at this sort of what we call a software development kit le level. And that's the, the part of Open Studio that's supported by the labs and NREL directly. And you know, that's where you know, having some skills in, in, in writing scripts and in doing some you know, Python combined with whatever allows us to start to really automate. So, okay, we've built this air to water heat pump system for this specific building. We can start to repeat that kind of system in the controls for other scenarios, right? And then when we start to actually, and then you know, Open Studio then has what's called Open Studio Server. Um, Pat is the user interface to that, which then allows you to actually access, say, Amazon Web Servers or other sort of cloud computing. You can use your local computer if you want, but that's, you know, you're going to be limited by your CPUs. But this is where we can actually then start to do, you know, we can use objective functions and, and there's some, some AI algorithms and, and learning algorithms sort of built into that package. And that's stuff that we used in the, you know, we use that in the, the runs for that specific building, but then we also can leverage it and start doing population analysis and start looking at more buildings. So um, I had a quick thing here, kind of what that looks like. I won't let it play the whole way because I'll try to get done. But, you know, so this is like an AI algorithm working through a calibration. Where we're trying to get to somewhere in the middle here, both for gas and electric use. And so the AI algorithm, like we give it a bunch of dials to turn. And we give it some ranges on the dials that it needs to stay in between. And then it does a whole bunch of experimentation on its own to figure out sort of where, you know, where to end up. And if I just fast forward it, you can kind of see like it tests some different ranges and everything and ends up kind of in this space, right? So that's just the general, that, that's the, the power of what we're able to do. In this case, the metric, right, is some guideline 14 metrics around um, calibration. But in our, you know, in our analysis around greenhouse gases and things like that, we can actually can program in whatever metrics we want. Um, and then I'll end with the, so the, the future of this all is, is FLM pilot. So FLM stands for flexible load management. So we have a program it's between Efficiency Vermont, Green Mountain Power, and a software company called Dynamic Organics, where now we're gonna take, you know, some of the lessons learned from this individual project and start running it on the, you know, 50 or so, there's about 50 buildings up to, I can sign up for this program. And so we can take these lessons learned we can take automation that we've built out of that and start using that to sort of help figure out like how do how do we actually structure a whole program where you have a, a, a distributed energy you know resource platform actually a software platform that has the ability to sort of reach into buildings and control them and so we use using the model here to sort of support the scenario analysis at the program scale there's a bunch of work at the labs again looking at integrating sort of bms nomenclature with these DER systems and in our building energy modeling so we can start to have um, better sort of digital twins and even just better use of population metrics. Um, I think a little bit over time. So sorry for the quick wrap up there. I do, I will call out the, the picture I hear I, I chose because it, honestly, like some of this feels so futuristic and everything, but it's really like, you know, we barely have our Strider bike on or our training wheels on in terms of where, where we need to go with this stuff for the, the future of the grid. Thank you. Thank you, great. It was a very fantastic presentation. Uh, we don't have too much time for uh, Q&A, but I have one question in the chat so I can share it with you. Uh, one of the, present uh, one of the um, audience asked, uh, good presentation so far, thank you. Do you feel the uh, price effectively represents carbon emissions like LEED and other programs have long tout approached that topic? Or are you suggesting it is more accurate to model using hourly profiles, profiles like um, ISO New England U short? I mean, in the end, in the end, the cost drove it, right? And, and, and the, 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 I think the real answer is that we need G, Green Mountain Power has done some work, like they, as part of that flexible load management. That's one of the, the things we are experimenting with. Is like, what are the what are the rate structures that are needed to fully support this? So I think. 
you know, the, the ultimate answer is that we need the we need rate structures, right, that reflect that hourly demand. In the meantime, what our approach to it is is, is we kind of look at both and, and analyze both, knowing that you know, if nothing else, then for our own learning, like let's keep track of how that hourly greenhouse gas emissions aligns with these different strategies, um, in hopes that we can inform cost structures that then can reflect that better. But I think the quick answer is is, is yeah, I think you can't really get around cost. And in general, the costing seems to follow the carbon reasonably well enough that, you know, it's a decent metric. Um, Great, thank you. Uh, also, um, Ajumal is asking, is the is this software is plugin like we can use with softwares like SketchUp, et cetera? Yeah, so so there is an, so Open Studio is a lot of different things. Um, and I'll actually, I, I'm, I've done some trainings with the Massachusetts in the past, and I think we're hoping to have some set up in the spring where I can, you know, you're welcome to attend those and, and learn more. But Open Studio is what we call a software development kit. So there is an app, which is kind of like, you know, what you're used to, like an eQuest or something. And then things like SketchUp, it has a, it's a little bit more complex than most in that, um, yeah, SketchUp, it has plugins to it more than it is a plugin, I guess. But it is a full software package that you then sort of use different pieces to do different um, parts of your analysis. Thank you, Greg. Um, I have uh, one more question. Uh, what resources did you and your team use when learning to apply Open Studio software development kit uh, with Python, for example, and Open Studio Server? Um, um, yeah, so so it it's definitely been educational for me in terms of learning how to expand um, the skill sets and in, in sort of a, a modeling team. Um, and so traditionally, you know, we have a couple of modelers like myself that just have a, a lot of experience, but then we've tapped into, you know, our, our company is big, diverse enough that there's some developers that do software for other things. And so it's been a lot of hybrid work between um, A, myself and others needing to just learn how to be a little more like software developers, and then also just tapping into those software developers themselves to help um, sort of get us across the finish line in a lot of cases. Uh, another question from Holly: Are there trainings for the AI component in Open Studio? There, there are. You know, and that's one thing. So, you know, I'm part of the Open Studio coalition, and, and the Open Studio application is is separate from the NREL work. They separated it off a, a couple of years ago, and we're trying to continue that. And part of we're a very nascent organization, though, so at this point, it's just kind of keep things working. But I, I, we do hope to sort of evolve into more of a training organization to help with stuff like that because. Um, yeah, there, there isn't, it's sort of a learn, you know, learn by doing right now, or, you know, you know, people are welcome to reach out to me. Um, and someone's, is this paid? So it is definitely not paid. So you, you pay for it in your sweat, I think at the moment would be the answer to that. Yeah, there, there's, there's a steep learning curve, but to us, it's been worth it. We've been able to do a lot of stuff we, we couldn't do otherwise. <clears throat> Thank you, Craig. Craig. So Justin, do we have any questions from uh, YouTube Live? We do not. Okay, great. So I think, we, sorry, we can move uh, to our next presentation. So I'm gonna introduce our next presenter. Uh, Nishesh is an architect, consultant, and a researcher in the field of building design, energy modeling, and operational performance of buildings with over nine years of experience. He specializes in energy and environmental performance assessments of new and existing buildings, and using simulations and model calibration to facilitate the process through building life cycle from design to operation. He has contributed to many industry guidance documents on modeling and simulation, and his recent work includes use of advanced parametric tools, such as optimization, uncertainty, and sensitivity analysis for informing building designs and calibration tools for better operational performance assessment. Thank you, Nishesh, for kindly accepting our invitation. We are very eager to hear your presentation. Hi, um, hopefully you can uh, see my screen. Um, so thank you, um, Shide, for the introduction and uh, also for to Craig for sharing his fantastic project work. Um, and my job here is a little simpler maybe or, or not, but I'll try to take the conversation into more into nuts and bolts of op optimization, and then from uh, you know, from a modeling mechanics context, and then I'll try to show various possibilities and examples 
kind of inspire you to use uh, genetic algorithm based optimization in your projects. So uh, in this presentation, I will first briefly introduce uh, you design builder software. And then after reviewing the optimization background and concepts, I'll show some case study examples where optimization has been used. And in the end, I'll also show you uh, various resources where you can learn about optimization and how to use it within design builder. So let's take a look at how uh, today's content uh, connects with design builder more widely. So Design Builder is a fully integrated simulation toolbox. It is a graphical user interface that enables you to use global gold standard simulation engines, including Energy Plus, Radiance, and OpenFoam in faster, easier, and more productive ways. Design Builder is the most capable and mature third-party interface to Energy Plus, and uh, it is also the same simulation engine that is run during optimization simulations. Um, and within Design Builder from a single model, you can do energy, comfort, and environmental performance assessments, run, run compliance simulations for LEED and BRIA, and also run cost daylighting and CFD simulations. Design Builder also includes the most advanced scripting capabilities of all the mainstream simulation tools. And our focus today is on optimization tools uh, that provides powerful ways to do advanced cost benefit analysis. So by dialing the wheel back, so what is optimization? Optimization is often maybe loosely used to describe relatively minor incremental improvements in the design. Uh, this is not the context for what I'm gonna present. What I'm presenting today is multi-criteria cost benefit analysis using genetic algorithms in an automated process to find optimal design solutions. So optimization is increasingly necessary as a part of design process for high performance buildings because a building is a complex ecosystem. It, is, it has thousands of different elements that interact with each other, such as fabric, glazing, shading, HVAC, lighting systems, and many more. Changing any one of these elements has a knock-on impact on many other elements leading to numerous permutations and combinations. So let's consider the size of the design space. Uh, that is the total number of possible combinations. So for example, if you have in your project a design variable such as glazing or amount of insulation or HVAC system or its controls, and then for each variable you have number of choices. So for example, in your HVAC system, you may have a choice to consider fan coils, VAV systems with boilers, chillers, or VRF or ground source heat pump, etc. cetera. Um, then in a design, if we had 10 design variables with just four choices for each of them, then it results in over a million possible combinations. Manually assessing them can take a huge amount of time and effort but optimization can help in this. Optimization enables you to search the whole design space quickly and efficiently by using genetic algorithms, which operate on the survival of the fittest principle. Using these algorithms, optimization ensures that all the strongest possible design solutions are identified. And this is what um, optimization process looks like in a flowchart. So in the first step, um, you define the objectives, constraints, and design variables. We have already discussed a little about variables, but objective and constraints are optimization terms that relate to model outputs. Objective define what is the success for a particular design um, and what it is measured against. Typically, you would have two objectives having conflicting criteria, such as uh, trying to minimize discomfort and energy use. And constraints can provide specific limits to avoid unrealistic solutions. So you can specify, say, uh, a maximum project cost. So once optimization starts, then the process becomes automated. It uh, will generate 
energy plus simulation files and uh, run it in batches. As the simulation happens, the optimizer assesses each batch and finds the strongest solutions. Subsequently, the optimizer takes the information from the strong solutions and creates future simulation batches. The whole process is repeated automatically until the optimizer has found all or most of the likely strong solutions. The optimal solutions are plotted in red in the Pareto optimal front and looks something like this. The X and Y axis show the objectives. In this case, to minimize net site energy consumption and capital cost. The point cloud indicates the performance of each of the simulation runs, each point representing a unique combination of design variables. White points are valid solutions that are not optimal. Yellow points are invalid solutions because they failed a constraint limit that was set. The red points on the Pareto front that represents unbeatable solutions with a particular construction cost that has the lowest energy consumption and vice versa. So um, this is a short sped up uh, video that illustrates how Pareto front develops for a small model. The design objectives are to minimize discomfort hours and operational carbon emissions. Individual simulations from the point cloud and algorithm selects the strongest solutions from each batch, slowly migrating towards the origin where the two objectives minimize. At the leading edge, that is the Pareto front, optimal solutions are marked. The Pareto front typically shows diminishing returns at the end of the curve. So solutions offering a balanced trade-off between the objectives are often found uh, kind of in the middle of the curve, which is closest to the origin. So um, hopefully now you have a clearer understanding about optimization in a building performance simulation context and the key underlying principles. I'll now take you through an optimization case study done using Design Builder. This project is a teaching building in a college campus. And because it is located within the tropics, the climate is hot and humid. Therefore, with regards to energy use and comfort, cooling is the most important factor. As cooling is the predominant energy end use, the study aims to optimize fabric and systems to minimize uh, cooling requirement and also minimizing the capital cost. The design options under consideration relate to construction, finishes, shading, HVAC, and lighting systems. The objectives, therefore, will be to minimize cooling demand and minimize the capital cost. And these becomes our uh, design variables. So um, through optimization, the design uh, will explore answers to questions such as, what is the most cost-effective HVAC system? Can capital expenditure be reduced by having better envelope in place of high efficiency HVAC system? What is the most efficient shading strategy? And can we introduce shading to reduce need for expensive glazing? So I will briefly show the various design variables and their options used in the study. First category looks at envelope thermal performance and has options based on varying insulation thicknesses in walls and roofs. The issue of thermal mass is explored by changing the location of insulation in external walls and also by varying the partition thicknesses. The window construction focuses on U value of the windows. Various shading options deal with direct solar gains as shading is a low cost way of reducing them. Besides U value, another variable related to the wall is the external surface finish, which has been incorporated by changing the solar absorptance of the outermost material. On the system side, lighting is a source of significant heat gains and selection of HVAC system also presents a trade-off between capital cost and efficiency. 
So all possible combinations for the design variable selected result in a very big search space. This is the finished result screen uh, of this run uh, after 1000 simulations. The capital cost is on the X axis and pooling energy is on the Y axis. The red dots as before show the solution that occupy the Pareto front. Analyzing this result in detail, the first and most obvious pattern are these four big clusters. These are for different HVAC systems. This shows that more efficient system significantly reduces the cooling energy use with relatively modest increase in cost. Then within each HVAC system cluster, we have three subclusters for different lighting systems. For example, the VRF cluster on the Pareto front, we can see that um, as per the costing information of this project, changing the lighting type has greater impact on cost than it has on cooling energy. Similar to this, analyzing other clusters and subclusters gave answers to some of the design questions we asked earlier, such as water pool chillers with better envelope can achieve similar performance as VRF systems, but with 3.5% cap capex saving. The effect of adding insulation and thermal mass beyond optimal level provides diminishing returns. And shading with simple double glazing saves 3% capital expenditure over the same performance when compared to only using uh, expensive glazing solutions. And there are more inferences that uh, can be drawn and other optimization analysis that can be done for this project. But the intent here is to show you the process. Um, now I will briefly show you some more case study example applications. Um, I'll start with a ground source heat pump optimization case study. This was done by Brendan Hall of CHA Consulting in Syracuse, New York. This project was completed for his previous employer, Skarpinski Engineering. Um, uh, Brendan's work focused on optimizing heating and cooling loads because the heat rejection to and from the bore field has a big impact on the total size and the cost of the ground loop that is installed. So optimization identified the combinations of various energy conservation measures, which had the greatest combined effect. And Brendan was able to reduce the ground heat exchanger length by about a third, leading to significant cost savings. Um, this next project uh, was shortlisted for SIPSI Building Simulation Group Award in 2018. And in this case, Arturo Ordo Ordonez of um, Solar uh, needed to reduce the construction cost and carbon emissions for new build house in Spain. And optimization was used to find the best trade off between window to wall ratios, thermal mass, insulation, glazing, and shading. And using design builder optimization, Arturo was able to find optimum solutions from about 170,000 combinations. So when compared to a typical house of that region, the design achieved over 47% reduction in total carbon emissions and 24% uh, savings in construction costs. Moving to another case study, um, this was completed and submitted for 2015 Ashley Energy Modeling Competition and optimization was at the heart of the overall project design workflow. So the project um, was on a 20 acre development site in Pittsburgh. And for as for many um, in intercity brownfield development sites, there was a number of challenges and planning constraints, including dealing with tall surrounding buildings. The design brief required mixed mode cooling using natural ventilation. And so that they can take advantage of the variable climate in Pittsburgh. And also the team required to present a fully costed solution to the client for an informed cost benefit analysis. So this is the workflow that was followed. That's a lot to say about it, but I'll keep it in brief. Um, the workflow proposed was a three-stage design process. The first stage building form and orientation were assessed. Um, an optimization study guided towards 
a rectangular building form with a internal courtyard because this form could effectively minimize loads provide enhanced daylight and natural ventilation in the second stage optimization was used to identify the best hvac lighting and pv systems this result showed that ground coupled vrf system with heat recovery provided the best balance between cost and performance then further optimization was done to fine tune the heating and cooling and natural ventilation control temperatures after optimization in the third stage the team used design builders integrated daylighting and cfd tools to finesse the other aspects of design overall this workflow helped the team uh, design a building that reduced energy use by 64% uh, compared to the ashray 90.1 baseline this workflow uh, was presented to ashray energy modeling conference in 2015 and won the best innovative workflow award now before i end um, i'll show you a range of free resources including case studies and previous webinars related to design builder optimization tools um, so you can access the selection of case studies from design builders homepage you scroll down to more case studies select the international option and you can see optimization for eco friendly house design using design builder another 2016 ashray lowdown showdown energy modeling competition entry that uses optimization and similarly there is performance for uh, optimization of a low temperature chill water plant etc so you can uh, read about these case studies here uh, past webinars you can find on the training page and webinar section of design builder website um so for example the uh, using energy modeling to optimize ground source heat pump system design um this is the brendan's project so if you want to view the webinar and look at the details for how um, they were able to deal with this you can uh, view it from here there is then there are these two webinars on uncertainty and sensitivity analysis uh, which is a very closely related topic to optimization then optimizing an eco friendly house design using design builder it is uh, the arturo's case study so you can find um, how this was developed on in this webinar and at the bottom there are uh, two webinars which are regarding the ashray um, uh, the basically ashray energy modeling competition that provide ideas and information related to optimization and project workflows so these free resources will give you great insight into optimization and its applications um and if you choose to use uh, design builder optimization then you can fast track your learning uh, by uh, with a focused uh, training which is available on the design builders um, site uh, in the online training section um, scrolling down to the bottom this design builder optimization fundamentals has the package and you can read the description about the uh, full course here so um i will um finish this presentation by reiterating that optimization makes possible for you to assess full range of design options in a commercially viable time frame and that it gives you full confidence that your recommendations are truly optimal and makes your clients very happy that you have done everything realistically possible to optimize their building and it also reduces your design risk thank you great thank you so much uh, nishesh for your interesting presentation so uh, craig is asking does design builder include a cost uh, database to assist with the optimization studies um so yeah so design builder does have a default costing structure uh, in there which you can uh, but they are basically um uh the default costs uh for each project your costing structure might change so you can go in and start changing those numbers um as 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 per your project details and um uh, you can um basically do the costing uh, assessment so these are all part of the 
for example you can go and change the system um, system costs or construction material costs etc within the existing um, interface thank you so um, does anybody have any other question you can raise your hand speak up I can ask a question, uh, but my question is mainly about the post-processing after the optimization. So I am interested to know what would be the best way to compare different optimal solutions. Uh, for instance, we have the Pareto front and there are lots of optimal solutions. What is the best way to say, for example, the difference between one optimal solution to other one? Or for example, if you have two sets of optimal solutions for two building modes, for example. So generally, you would want to um, uh, use. So you have to do some some level of cluster analysis there, and uh, there are tools uh, available where you can, for example, the calculated results from the optimization study. You can uh, put them. I think there is something called um, uh, Orange or or something. You will find one of these tools in Arturo's webinar if you want to look at because he exactly did the same thing. He had multiple um multiple building optimization results for different typologies and then what you end up doing is you start um analyzing uh, no okay uh, we fix one um one parameter and then you see where all those clusters lie for those those parameters so you can start you know color coding them differently or increasing their sizes to kind of visually inspect uh, those numbers and uh, see uh, where they lie on the cost benefit uh, um, curve. So actually design builder is in development. Uh, we, are, we are developing some of more tools to assist with these kind of analysis as well. And uh, keep an eye out um, on our uh, newsletters and stuff about um, uh, analytics platform, which we are developing to do these. Um, so bubble plots, et cetera, you can create and you know, Maybe you can start doing parallel coordinate exercises to um, identify. So all these are various tools which you can use to uh, assess. Thank you. That was very informative. Uh, so uh, I'm not sure if there are any more questions from other participants. Uh, Justin, do we have any questions from our live stream on YouTube? None in YouTube currently. Okay. So uh, I guess uh, we can like close our meeting. Uh, thank you everyone for attending uh, our today's presentation. Oh, we have one question. Uh, how do you verify and trust the analysis? Good one. <laughs> uh, the same way you verify uh, on a cheeky side, same way you verify and trust the simulation results. So uh, the reason you will be uh, at least to identify um, what solutions are uh, you know, optimal and the others, you are basically plotting uh, results against each other. So um, the genetic algorithm is efficient enough to start eliminating uh, some of these uh, unviable solutions, etc., because you define the boundaries of those analysis. Um, so yeah, and However, at the end of it, there is modular judgment also uh, required when you start proposing things that things are uh, possible or not. Thank you. Um, also, Dr. Zhang is mentioning, Nishat, you can mention the design builders QA tools. Oh yes, definitely. There is um, a lot of uh, QA uh, checking uh, tools available in Design Builder where you can uh, try and you know uh, check models in 3D uh, 3D images and uh, basically try to see false color rendered images to see if the model is right or not. And you can also visualize data in grid forms to see. Uh, data if it, if it is good quality data or not so there are uh, there are um, inbuilt tools in design builder which you can use for these quality checks for individual models as well yeah 
and Dr. Zhang, because he, he, he mentioned we actually there are some tools which uh, Enzymes has also developed to maybe you can do post processing of your optimization results, if I'm not wrong. But yeah. Uh, also, we have a question, one more question. Uh, does Design Builder have tools to create the matrix of design variable options? Could you talk through process of setting up parametric runs? Does it require Python or is there an user interface? Wow. So this is basically a question for entire webinar on process of setting up parametric runs. Actually, uh, you remember I uh, showed you um, uh, the other um, webinars which you could see from Design Builder page. So um, I think there are a few of them which actually uh, discuss about setting these things from scratch for all parametric runs. So definitely you can find that information there. Design Builder program help, help also contains basics of setting these things up. Um, and uh, we have, so the thing is for most uh, common applications, you might not require any Python uh, work to set up your um, set up your model and do basic design stage uh, optimization parametric uncertainty sensitivity analysis but that tool is very uh, conveniently uh, not conveniently very integratedly hooked up with the scripting tools in design builder so when you can actually write python scripts to make uh, the simulation engine optimization engine uh, work on almost any input parameter and any output result as a part of your uh, exercise. So yeah, these things are, are possible. You will find a lot of it covered in one of the previous case studies, which I mentioned. Thank you so much, uh, Nishesh, for your elaborative information. Uh, we are running out of time. So uh, thank you everyone uh, for attending today's meeting. I hope that we all see you in our upcoming meetings, like monthly meeting. We have lots of interesting topics uh, for the following month. So uh, if there is, uh, thank you. Uh, so if there is nothing else to mention, we can, I think we can close the session. Thank you again, uh, Craig and Nishesh for your very informative and uh, interesting presentations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, Shida. Bye. Bye.